Maxillary anesthesia increasing the success of injection techniques with Dr. Gregory G. Winter. He completed his DDS from the Baltimore College of Dental Surgery, University of Maryland School of Dentistry. He received an additional training at the University of Pittsburgh School of Dental Medicine and York Hospital, where he did his general practice residency. He received a faculty appointment at the University of Maryland School of Dentistry in the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery as a clinical instructor. He maintains a private practice focused on general dentistry in Baltimore, Maryland. Ms. Marion C. Mansky, RDH, MS, is the Associate Professor, Senior Coordinator at the University of Bridgeport, Phone School of Dental Hygiene. She earned her MS degree from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. In addition to her faculty appointment at the University of Bridgeport, she serves as adjunct faculty at the University of Maryland where she conducts the local anesthesia courses for students and licensed dental hygienists. Local anesthesia of the maxilla is commonly achieved by supraperiosteal injection. This technique works well because of the comparatively thin porous nature of the alveolar bone, allowing the local anesthetic to reach the nerve fibers innervating the teeth and surrounding periodontium. Supraperiosteal injections can be used singularly to anesthetize individual teeth or in combination over an entire quadrant. Individual superperiosteal injection techniques will be described later in this program. On occasion, profound anesthesia may not be obtained, especially in the region of the maxillary first molar, where dense bone may impede distribution of anesthetic. In cases of acute inflammation or infection, superperiosteal injections may be ineffective or even contraindicated. Three other approaches for anesthesia in the maxilla may be alternative to the superperiosteal technique and are described later in this program. These are the infraorbital nerve block, the posterior superior nerve block, and the maxillary second division nerve block. These techniques are easily learned and can be especially helpful with procedures involving multiple teeth. Objectives. List the three large nerve trunks originating from the trigeminal ganglion. Describe the origins of the maxillary nerve. Review structures innervated by the various branches of the maxillary nerve. It is critical to understand that the bone in the maxilla is much less dense than the mandible. Visualization is also a key factor in maxillary anesthesia success. Due to the anatomy on the maxilla, the injections will only give anesthesia to the buccal areas. If you want to get palatal anesthesia, you do have to give a supplemental palatal injection. However, if you use articane, you can get both the buccal and the lingual in almost 90% of the time because the articane diffuses really nicely through bone. The oral cavity receives innervation from the trigeminal or the fifth cranial nerve. The sensory cell bodies of the nerve form a large half-moon shaped ganglion called the trigeminal semilunar or Gasserian ganglion, which is situated in the trigeminal depression of the middle cranial fossa. Originated from the trigeminal ganglion are three large nerve trunks, the ophthalmic V1, the maxillary V2, and the mandibular V3. The maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve is exclusively sensory and innervates the skin of the middle portion of the face, lower eyelid, side of nose and upper lip, the mucosa of the nasopharynx, maxillary sinus, soft palate, tonsil and hard palate, and the maxillary teeth, periodontium, alveolar bone, and gingiva. The maxillary nerve exits the cranium through the foramen rotundum to reach the pterygopalatine fossa where it gives off several branches, the zygomatic nerve, the pterygopalatine nerve, 
and the posterior superior alveolar nerve. The zygomatic nerve enters the orbit through the inferior orbital fissure. Its branches supply the skin on the side of the forehead and prominence of the cheek. A small branch communicates with the lacrimal nerve of the ophthalmic division to carry secretory fibers to the lacrimal gland. The short pterygopalatine nerve trunks descend vertically to course through the pterygopalatine ganglion. Branches of the pterygopalatine nerve emanating from the ganglion distribute sensory fibers to the mid-face. These branches include the orbital nerves and posterior nasal nerves, which innervate the ethmoidal and sphenoidal sinuses, periosteum of the orbit, nasal turbinates, and posterior nasal septum. One of these branches, the nasopalatine nerve, passes downward and forward on the nasal septum, enters the incisive canal, and reaches the oral cavity via the incisive foramen to provide sensation to the palatal mucosa of the premaxilla. A pharyngeal branch also exits the ganglion posteriorly to serve portions of the sphenoidal sinus and mucosa posterior to the auditory tube. Palatine branches of the pterygopalatine nerve pass down the pterygopalatine canal and exit via the foramina on the posterior lateral aspect of the hard palate. The greater or anterior palatine nerve emerges through the greater palatine foramen to supply general sensation to the soft tissues of the hard palate and palatal gingiva. The other branches exit from the lesser palatine foramina and innervate the soft palate, uvula, and tonsillar area. The posterior superior alveolar nerve is the last branch to leave the maxillary trunk within the pterygopalatine fossa. Before it enters the maxilla, Gingival branches are given off to innervate the buccal soft tissues of the maxillary molar and tuberosity region. The nerve then enters the maxilla and continues down the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, ultimately contributing fibers to the superior dental plexus. The PSA nerve innervates the maxillary molar teeth with the possible exception of the mesial buccal root of the first molar, the surrounding periodontium and adjacent buccal mucosa, and the mucous membrane of the maxillary sinus. The maxillary nerve trunk becomes the infraorbital nerve once it crosses the inferior orbital fissure to travel within the infraorbital groove and canal. During its course, the anterior superior alveolar nerve is given off. After contributing to the superior dental plexus, it provides pulpal innervations to the incisors, canine, and often premolars, the periodontium and facial gingiva, and the anterior portion of the antrum and the floor of the nasal cavity. If present, the middle superior alveolar nerve supplies sensation to the premolar region and the mesiobuccal root of the first molar. The infraorbital nerve emerges from the infraorbital foramen to divide into its terminal branches. Objectives. List three factors that contribute to patient safety and comfort during the administration of local anesthesia. Describe proper care and handling of contaminated needles and cartridges. Discuss the factors to consider when selecting a needle. Understand the advantages of different gauge needles. So there are many advantages for using the aspirating, breech-loading, reusable syringe. Mm -hmm. One, it is long-lasting and sterilizable. Two, when you use the cartridge of anesthesia, you're actually able to see the anesthesia be delivered through the needle. And third, when you aspirate, you're able to visualize whether you have a positive uh, aspiration. Yes, I agree with that. Um, in addition, the syringe sometimes, though, is heavy and it is also large for some operators. Their hands might not be big enough, so that's why that they have the petite syringes to use, which are really great. There are many considerations when selecting a needle. First, it needs to be stainless steel and sterile, and also it has to be disposable. However, these needles do dull quickly, so you can use it about four times before you have to switch to a new needle. It's appropriate to use a short needle for infiltrations. That's typically all throughout the maxilla and some areas on the mandible. The long is primarily used for blocks, and right. that's on the maxilla and the mandible. Right. We also have to consider the gauge size. The needle gauge refers to the diameter of the lumen. 
The larger the gauge, the smaller the diameter of the needle. There are three sizes for the needle gauge. There's the 25, the 27, and the 30 gauge needles. The 25 is the most rigid needle with the least amount of deflection. That's followed by a 27 gauge. Lastly, there's a 30 gauge needle, which is the least rigid and has the most amount of deflection. And you choose a needle size depending on what depth the penetration you're needing to go to. So typically, if you're doing a, a block, you're going to choose a 25 or a 27. 30s are pretty much for infiltration. Well, it's interesting because patients typically can't tell the difference between a 25, a 27, or a 30 gauge needle. Studies show that if you use a 25 gauge needle, you have a 100% chance of detecting an aspiration. If you use 30 gauge needle, you only have a 2% chance of detecting an aspiration, meaning you could be in the blood vessel and not know it. And typically we use 25s or 27s most of the time, and you need to do uh, aspirations two times. You have to get two negative aspirations to make sure you're not in, in a vessel to truly be successful with local anesthesia. When used correctly, the single dose cartridge, sterile needle, Jenker recapper, and aspirating syringe combine to ensure accurate placement of the local anesthetic solution with minimal risk to the patient. Proper care and handling of contaminated needles and cartridges will reduce the risk of sharp exposure to the patient and clinician. Needles should be immediately covered by a protective shield to prevent accidental needle stick with a contaminated needle. Several devices are available to assist with recapping. Recapping devices come in cardboard, metal, and plastic materials. Approved sharps containers are mandated to dispose of contaminated needles, used cartridges, and other sharps. The containers should be properly disposed of according to federal, state, and local regulations. When used correctly, the single-dose cartridge, sterile needle, and aspirating syringe combine to ensure accurate placement of the local anesthetic solution with minimal risk to the patient. For most maxillary blocks, the 25 to 27 gauge long needle is generally preferred. Topical Anesthesia Objective Discuss the application of topical anesthesia prior to the administration of local anesthesia. There's many different types of topical anesthetics. There's sprays, gels, liquids, and ointments. For our training purposes, we're going to be using 20% benzocaine. We like to use the benzocaine because it's an overdose problem is very low and it's poorly absorbed systemically, so you don't have any concerns with that particular ester. There are certain topicals and injectables that should be delivered with care. There's a genetic condition called methemoglobinemia, which can cause issues for certain patients. You should consult directions for proper use. To desensitize the mucosa before the needle insertion, a topical anesthetic is applied to the injection site. The mucosa is first dried with gauze and a small amount of topical anesthetic is then placed with a cotton tipped applicator. After the topical anesthetic agent has had time to take effect, approximately one minute for mucosal tissue, two minutes for palatal, it will result in mucosal anesthesia to a depth of approximately two to three millimeters. Residual topical anesthetic and surface debris are removed with gauze immediately before the injection. Objectives. List the nerves anesthetized by the infraorbital nerve block. Describe the process for locating the infraorbital foramen prior to injection. Explain the vertical approach for the infraorbital nerve block injection, including anatomical landmarks for insertion and depth of penetration. The infraorbital nerve block will anesthetize in one injection all peripheral branches of the infraorbital nerve, the anterior superior alveolar nerve, the middle superior alveolar nerve. At times, local anesthesia can be obtained from the central incisor to the mesial buccal root of the first molar. The target site for the injection is the infraorbital foramen. Although several approaches have been described, the vertical approach is the safest and most commonly used. Before injection, it is important to locate the infraorbital foramen. When the patient is looking straight ahead, a line drawn vertically from the medial aspect of the pupil will overlay the foramen. The foramen is identified by palpating the infraorbital rim and feeling a notch or roughness corresponding to the zygomatico-maxillary suture. 
Then, sliding the finger inferiorly, five to 10 millimeters will bring it to rest in a depression containing the infraorbital foramen. Anatomically, the pupil, infraorbital notch, and infraorbital foramen lie in a straight line. The clinician should be seated in front of the patient with the patient's neck extended and the head turned to permit visualization of the premolar region. The mouth may remain closed. The index finger is placed over the infraorbital foramen and the upper lip is retracted by the thumb, pulling taut the tissues in the mucobuccal fold. The needle is then inserted vertically about five millimeters lateral to the second premolar and parallel to the long axis of the tooth with the bevel of the needle toward the face. The orientation of the needle as seen from the front of the patient should mirror a vertical line defined by the medial aspect of the pupil and the infraorbital foramen. For this and other injections described in this program, a few drops of anesthetic expressed as the needle is slowly advanced is useful in minimizing discomfort. The average depth of penetration is about 15 millimeters. After negative aspiration, injection is made with the palpating finger remaining in place to help guide local anesthetic solution into the infraorbital canal. A total of one milliliter or about one half of a dental cartridge is injected slowly. As with all other injections, the needle is then slowly withdrawn and recapped. Because of crossover fibers from the contralateral side, anesthesia of the central incisor may be incomplete unless a super periosteal injection is made over that tooth. An important advantage of this vertical approach is that the overhang of the infraorbital rim protects the eye from accidental needle puncture. Correct orientation of the needle bevel during insertion offers two potential advantages. First, if bone is contacted prematurely, the heel of the needle bevel will tend to glide gently off the bone without scraping the periosteum. Second, the spread of anesthetic into the foramen and canal may be aided. Objectives. List the structures anesthetized by the posterior superior alveolar nerve block. Describe the target insertion site and deposition for the posterior superior alveolar nerve block. Explain potential complications of the posterior superior alveolar nerve block and ways to reduce risk occurrence. The PSA nerve block is technique sensitive because of the anatomy and aspiration risk. The location of the pterygopalatine plexus is very close to the needle and a hematoma is a real possibility. Dental hygienists will not use the PSA nerve block. We would use a PSA infiltration as would other dental professionals because it's less invasive. The PSA nerve block anesthetizes the mucosa and the pulps of all of the molars. However, sometimes the mesial buccal root of the first molar is not anesthetized. If this is the case, a supplemental injection known as the MSA needs to be given. The posterior superior alveolar nerve block is used to produce anesthesia of the posterior maxilla. Usually all three maxillary molars are anesthetized along with the surrounding periodontium and maxillary buccal mucosa. However, a separate supraperiosteal injection over the maxillary second premolar or mesial buccal root of the first molar may be required to ensure complete anesthesia of the first molar. This injection is generally referred to as the middle superior alveolar and will be discussed later in this program. The target site for the posterior superior alveolar nerve block lies in the posterior aspect of the maxilla, about one centimeter above and medial to the apices of the third molar. The nerve enters the maxilla here through one or more foramina. Because this area is convex, the needle must be inserted in a backward, upward, and inward direction. For a left-handed operator that's performing a right or left posterior superior alveolar nerve block, the operator may sit at the two o'clock position. For the right-handed operator, they may sit at the eight o'clock position with the patient's neck extended and the head turned to permit visualization of the maxillary buccal vestibule. Once a cheek retractor has been placed in the vestibule, the mouth is partially closed and the jaw is moved laterally to the site of the injection. This maneuver relieves the tension of the cheek and moves the coronoid process away from the injection area. The needle puncture point is in the height of the vestibule immediately behind the zygomatic process. It is normally situated between the distal buccal root of the second molar and the mesial buccal root of the third molar. The zygomatic process is easily identified by gentle palpation buccal to the first molar. As the probe is moved posteriorly, it falls behind the process indicating the insertion site. The distal boundary of the zygomatic process is palpated. The needle is carefully advanced to the insertion point and oriented medially as well as posteriorly and superiorly.
For the average adult, the needle access should be at an angle of 45 degrees to all three planes. For clinicians performing a PSA infiltration, this is 6 millimeters above the second molar parallel to the long axis of the tooth. The needle is slowly advanced to a depth of 15 millimeters. After careful aspiration, one half to one cartridge of anesthetic solution or about one to 1.8 milliliters is slowly injected. With the proximity of the posterior superior alveolar artery and the pterygoid venous plexus, hematoma formation is a potential complication. This risk, quite low with proper technique, is increased if the needle is inserted too far laterally and especially if it is redirected while embedded in the tissue. Both errors tend to occur when the operator allows the cheek to torque the syringe medially during injection. If the insertion point is too anterior or too close to the alveolar process, or if the angulation is too vertical or too medial, premature contact with bone will occur. In these situations, the needle should be withdrawn and correctly repositioned for a new insertion. Objectives. List the structures anesthetized by the middle superior alveolar field block. Describe anatomical landmarks for the injection site and depth of penetration. State the recommended volume of solution deposited to achieve profound anesthesia. The MSA nerve block would be given if you've given other injections in the maxilla and you find that the first molar is not anesthetized. However, only about 28% of the population even have the MSA nerve. As previously stated, a separate supraperiosteal injection over the maxillary second premolar or mesiobuccal root of the first molar is required to ensure complete anesthesia of the first molar. This is the middle superior alveolar field block. The middle superior alveolar field block will anesthetize structures innervated by the middle superior alveolar nerve when present and its terminal branches to include the pulp of the maxillary first and second premolars and their facial soft tissues. For a right-handed operator that is performing a middle superior alveolar injection, the clinician may sit at the eight o'clock position for the right side or the nine o'clock position for the left side. For a left-handed operator, the clinician may sit at the four o'clock position for the right side or the three o'clock position for the left side. The alveolar mucosal tissue is palpated at the injection site in the vestibule at the height of the mucobuccal fold superior to the apex of the maxillary second premolar to ensure only soft tissue is injected. Using a 27 gauge short needle, orient the syringe parallel to the long axis of the tooth with the large window facing the operator. Insert the needle at the height of the mucobuccal fold at the apex of the maxillary second premolar, approximately one-fourth of the depth of the short needle, about five millimeters or until the bevel is slightly superior to the apex of the tooth. Aspirate within two planes. Slowly deposit 0.9 to 1.2 milliliters of solution, about one-half to two-thirds of the cartridge over 60 to 90 seconds. Objectives. List the structure anesthetized by the anterior superior alveolar nerve block. Describe anatomical landmarks for the injection site of the anterior superior alveolar nerve block. State recommended volume of solution deposited and rate of deposition. The ASA injection anesthetizes the central, lateral, canine, and premolar area. It's really critical that you be mesial to the canine eminence when giving this injection. If anesthesia is required in the maxillary anterior teeth, the anterior superior alveolar nerve block may be used. The anterior superior alveolar nerve block anesthetizes structures innervated by the anterior superior alveolar nerve, including the pulp of the maxillary central incisor through the canine on the injected side and their facial periodontium. The right-handed operator that is performing the anterior superior alveolar nerve block, the clinician may sit in the eight o'clock position. For a left-handed operator, the clinician may sit in the four o'clock position. 
palpate the alveolar mucosal tissue at the injection site in the vestibule at the height of the mucobuccal fold superior to the apex of the maxillary canine, just anterior to and parallel with the canine eminence to ensure only soft tissue is injected. Using a 27 gauge short needle, orient the bevel of the needle away from the large window of the syringe to ensure the bevel orientation is toward the bone. Place the syringe parallel with the long axis of the tooth. Insert the needle at the height of the mucobuccal fold at the apex of the maxillary canine, just anterior to and parallel with the canine eminence, and approximately 10 degree angle off an imaginary line drawn to the long axis of the tooth. Aspirate within two planes. Slowly deposit 0.6 to 0.9 milliliters of solution, about one third to one half of the cartridge over 30 to 60 seconds. Objectives. List the structures anesthetized by the nasopalatine nerve block. Explain the technique used to identify the greater palatine foramen. Describe the approach used for the nasopalatine nerve block, including insertion and deposition site. You can alleviate the pain associated with palatal injections by applying pressure for at least 30 seconds with a cotton tip applicator. You may find it difficult to inject the local anesthetic because of the close adaptation of the tissue to the bone. In addition, hitting bone and backing up is important so that the periosteum is not damaged. Greater palatine nerve blocks are indicated for pain management of palatal soft and osseous tissues distal to the canine in one quadrant. For the right-handed operator that is performing the injection on the right side, they may sit at the 8 or 9 o'clock position or the 11 o'clock position for the left side. A left-handed clinician may sit at the 3 or 4 o'clock position for the right side or the 1 o'clock position for the left side. Locate the greater palatine foramen by gently sliding a cotton-tipped applicator along the hard palate surface starting at the junction of the maxillary alveolar process and the posterior hard palate near the maxillary first molar. Move distally until the cotton-tipped applicator falls into a depression, the greater palatine foramen. Apply firm pressure with a cotton-tipped applicator directly over the depression to provide surface pressure anesthesia. Using a 27 gauge short needle, Direct it from the contralateral side of the mouth at a 90 degree angle to the palate toward the cotton tipped applicator. Insert the needle slightly anterior to the greater palatine foramen, 3 to 6 millimeters until the palatine bone is contacted. Aspirate, slowly depositing approximately 0.45 milliliters of solution, about one fourth of the cartridge. Nasopalatine nerve blocks are indicated for pain management of palatal soft and osseous tissue in the anterior third of the palate approximately from canine to canine. Sit at an 11 o'clock position for the right-handed operator and a 1 o'clock position for the left-handed operator. The deposit location or target area for the nasopalatine nerve block is the incisive foramen beneath the incisive papilla. The injection site is the palatal tissue lateral to the incisive papilla, which is located at the midline. Never insert the needle directly into the incisive papilla because this can be extremely painful. Pressure anesthesia is performed utilizing a cotton-tipped applicator on the palatal tissue on the contralateral side of the incisive papilla. Insert the needle into the previously blanched tissue at a 45 degree angle to the palate. Advance the needle until the maxillary bone is contacted and then the injection is administered. Aspirate and slowly deposit 0.45 milliliters of solution, about one fourth of the cartridge, over 20 to 30 seconds. Objectives. List the structure anesthetized by the maxillary nerve block. Describe the three approaches used to deliver the maxillary nerve block injection. The V2 block is considered a true maxillary block and is primarily used by dentists. 
The V2 block will be used during periodontal or oral surgery. It anesthetizes the buccal and palatal tissues in the entire quadrant. The V2 maxillary injection is very technique sensitive. It's technique sensitive during the greater palatine approach because in 5 to 15 percent of cases there are bony obstructions within the canal. The maxillary or second division nerve block will anesthetize the entire quadrant of the maxilla with a single injection. The target of the injection is the maxillary nerve as it passes through the pterygopalatine fossa. Three approaches to the maxillary nerve block are possible. The high tuberosity approach is the easiest to perform technically and the least likely to cause discomfort, but it is the most likely to cause a clinically evident hematoma. The pterygopalatine canal approach ensures accurate placement of the needle provided it can be successfully inserted up the canal. This injection also requires a separate palatal infiltration to minimize discomfort. The extraoral approach in which the pterygopalatine fossa is accessed percutaneously requires disinfection of the skin, is rarely used, and will not be demonstrated. The high tuberosity approach is almost identical to the posterior superior alveolar nerve block, except that the needle is inserted much deeper and slightly more medially to enter the pterygopalatine fossa via the pterygomaxillary fissure. Insertion is at the height of the mucobuccal fold, just behind the zygomatic process in an upward, inward, and backward direction. With proper orientation, the needle tip will come to rest at or within the pterygopalatine fossa, slightly lateral to and about one centimeter below the maxillary nerve. For a left high tuberosity injection, a left-handed operator may sit at the two o'clock position facing the patient. A right-handed operator may sit at 10 o'clock. For a right high tuberosity injection, a left-handed operator may sit at the 4 o'clock position, while a right-handed operator may sit at the 8 o'clock position. The patient's neck is extended and the head turned to permit visualization of the buccal vestibule. A finger is used to palpate the zygomatic process. The mouth is partially closed and the jaw is shifted toward the side of the injection. With the palpating finger placed over the zygomatic process, the needle is carefully moved into position. The needle tip is inserted in the height of the vestibule as previously described and slowly advanced superiorly, medially, and posteriorly along a straight path to a depth of 30 millimeters for the average adult. After a negative aspiration, the entire contents of the 1.8 milliliter cartridge is slowly injected. Premature contact of bone requires that the needle be withdrawn before being reoriented to minimize the chances of hematoma formation. A positive stop against bone near the final depth of insertion probably means that the needle has impinged on the pterygoid plate. In this case, the needle should be withdrawn slightly, a negative aspiration obtained, and the anesthetic solution injected. Anesthesia will often be obtained because of medial spread of the solution. If it is not, reinjection along a slightly more medial pathway can then be performed. The pterygopalatine approach to the maxillary nerve block uses the greater palatine foramen as the insertion point and the pterygopalatine canal to guide the needle to its target. The foramen is usually located adjacent to the alveolar bone between the distal half of the second molar and the mesial half of the third molar. The pterygopalatine canal travels upward and backward to reach the pterygopalatine fossa. When the needle is inserted to a depth of 30 millimeters for the average adult, the tip will lie one centimeter beneath the maxillary nerve. For this injection, a 25 gauge long needle is recommended. However, a 27 gauge long needle is also acceptable. For a left-handed operator that is performing both the right and left pterygopalatine canal injections, the clinician may sit at the 11 o'clock position. The right-handed operator may sit at the 8 o'clock position. To provide visibility, the patient should extend the neck and open the mouth widely. The crater palatine foramen can be identified by placing a round probe at the junction of the maxillary alveolar process and hard palate. As the probe is moved posteriorly from the second molar, it will appear to fall into the fovea created by the foramen. Topical anesthesia of the hard palate is not easily achieved with conventional preparations. Additional anesthesia may be obtained by applying pressure to the injection site with a cotton tip applicator. Locate the greater palatine foramen. Direct the syringe into the mouth from the opposite side with the needle approaching the injection site at a right angle. Place the bevel against the soft tissue at the injection site. 
The needle must be well stabilized to prevent accidental penetration of the tissues. With the bevel lying against the tissue, apply enough pressure to bow the needle slightly. Deposit a small volume of local anesthetic. Straighten the needle and permit the bevel to penetrate the mucosa. Continue to deposit small volumes of anesthetic throughout the procedure. Continue to apply pressure with the cotton tip applicator stick during this part of the procedure. The greater palatine nerve block is now complete. Probe gently for the greater palatine foramen. After locating the foramen, very slowly advance the needle into the greater palatine canal to a depth of 30 millimeters. Aspirate in two planes. If negative, deposit slowly 1.8 milliliters of solution over a minimum of one minute. Withdraw the syringe and wait a minimum of three to five minutes before starting the dental procedure. Perhaps one-tenth of the canals have bony obstructions that may prevent passage of the needle. If the canal cannot be negotiated, then the injection should be aborted. Excessive force can lead to needle breakage, perforation of the thin medial wall of the canal, or deflection of the needle laterally into the infratemporal fossa. If the needle pierces the medial wall of the pterygopalatine canal and enters the nasal cavity, air will be drawn back into the syringe during aspiration. If the needle is advanced too high in the pterygopalatine fossa, as can happen in children and small adults, blockade of the nerve supplying the orbit can occur. This rare complication can result in diplopia, and even temporary loss of vision. The patient should be advised that these effects are transient and will disappear as the local anesthetic dissipates. In closing, we'd like to reinforce the topics discussed in this local anesthesia video. It's important to select the most appropriate technique for the safety of your patient. Successful and safe local anesthesia is the foundation for clinical dentistry. Only with a thorough understanding of local anesthetic techniques and their anatomical basis can we accomplish our goal of providing high quality dentistry in a pain-free environment. Before using any of the drugs or devices discussed or pictured in this program, clinicians should consult the full prescribing information.